Welcome to the first episode of a series I call The Fast and the Curious. I'm fascinated by all things business, technology, electric vehicles, and most importantly, meeting new people. Today, I have the opportunity to meet with founder of Electric, Mandeep Patel. So let's get the show on the road. All right, well, thanks again, Mandeep, for joining. This is awesome that no you're able to make time uh, to do this interview. So I think we're gonna take a stroll through Houston. So it's oh, electric, yeah. not yes. electric. Nope, not um, at all. So we, so it's a play on words, right? So you're gonna take a trip in an electric vehicle. So we called it electric. Okay. Yeah. Clever. <laughs> yeah. When you're trying to travel, and the place you're going to is like longer than an hour in car, okay. but less than five, less it's than five really hours. difficult to get to that spot. So if you think about all the cities in Texas, Dallas is four hours away, Austin's two and a half, San Antonio's three out of Houston. If you fly, the amount of time it takes for you to get through security, and it's not even a nice process, right? The TSA doesn't even help anymore. I feel like that line's longer than sometimes a Pre-check, line. Yeah. right, yeah. It, it's crazy. So you spend 30 minutes in the air and about three hours going through BS that you didn't have to. Right. If you drive yourself and you're a working professional, you're gonna be behind the wheel for at least three hours. You're gonna be in meetings all day, six to 10 hours in that day, maybe yeah. 12 if you're a hardworking lawyer or consultant. Right. And then you're behind the wheel again. 300,000 drowsy driving accidents happen every single year. Wow. Of a tremendous amount of liability. And you also lose six hours of productivity. Imagine what you could do with that, right? Imagine what you could do with those six hours of productivity. You could be answering emails or stuff like that. That means by the time you get home from your business trip, you actually get to spend that time with your kids. Yeah. Right? You can actually do things that you want to do and you care about doing. Right. Because all the emails you've been getting throughout the day, you're sitting in this, this car, yep. you got Wi-Fi, you got laptop charging, and you can be as productive as you would be if you were in the office. I launched this in March of 2018. So I basically took my life savings. My mom co-signed on the first car that we bought. Which was a Tesla. Which was a Tesla, which is crazy. I think Tesla is becoming really cool, right? Yeah. Like people see these cars and especially the younger generation to them, this is so clearly the future right. because they're used to dealing with big touchscreens on their phones, yeah. on the computers. So when they look at a traditional interface, it doesn't make as much sense as this does to them. Right. And when, when an older individual gets in the vehicle, it takes them some adjusting because it is so different. Look, I have to learn some things, and I can only imagine with my my parents or anyone's parents, as you probably know, struggle to like, hey, DVR, TV's messed up, whatever. Like, yeah, we're like this basically is a, IT, right? Yeah. Like your your kids are like your IT department, right? right? Like and at then, home. How to work the? Should we take that guy? I'm no, I, I, I'm pretty. <laughs> the ludicrous mode would accelerate faster than it. It beat us on the track, but. What car was that? So that was like a Ferrari. I couldn't see it well enough to check like what model. The only Ferrari that's faster on a straight line is a LaFerrari and it's a hybrid system. So uh, kind of interesting. You just, you look at the fundamentals behind an EV and it's super difficult to justify hybrids and internal combustion engine vehicles. And when you say hybrid, just because it's got a gas component, right? Yeah, so you've component. actually made the system more complex. It takes over a hundred parts to move an internal combustion engine vehicle forward. In a Tesla, it's 17, and four of those parts are the wheels. 13 parts to, yes. uh, move, to move the car vehicle. forward. Versus yeah. 100, that's 100 so... plus. Uh, so, and then if you add a hybrid, you're adding an entire new system that can fail. So if you look at an inter like an EV, if something breaks, it's really easy to diagnose. That's yeah, it's one of 13. <laughs> it's one of 13 <laughs> parts. parts yeah. So you can go through it, fix it really easily. And that's why like uh, an EV per mile costs about 20 cents per mile an internal combustion engine vehicle will cost you like 90 cents. So you wanted to go to Austin and you wanted to use a private limo service, Got it. it would cost you 450. Wow, okay. With our service, it was 250. There were three things that helped us bring the cost down. So the first one I've already mentioned is EVs right. and that dropped it from 450 to 250. The second factor is getting enough rides between the cities so you eliminate deadheading. So once you're doing about 10 to 12 rides per day between Houston and Austin, wow. you can balance those rides really well. But that reduced the cost from 250 to 165. The last factor that's gonna bring the cost all the way down to $90 for the entire vehicle, private, one way, is autonomous driving. How I, long are we waiting for that? Depends on who you ask. Elon says it's gonna be here like by the end of the year. 
right? That's what he's promised. I think because of the 1% scenarios where something can go wrong, it's gonna take at least two years to make sure that every time you get into an autonomous vehicle, you're good to go. The autonomous driving is so good right now that a lot of Tesla drivers will like put a weight on their steering wheel to artificially tell, trick the car into thinking like you're attentive and then they'll just Peace out. And you've seen like, like go sit in the back seat. Yeah, like go sit. In the, I mean, they filmed a porno in one of these on serious? autopilot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For research purposes, I can send you the link. But the point is, <laughs> the point is they've done it, and and so like, it causes accidents. But I see a lot of apartment complexes, and they and they pride themselves on like, oh, we're really environmentally friendly, and and we offer all these like ways to reduce your carbon footprint, but they don't have EV charging. Selling to apartments every day, it's like I'm like, dude, you got this small window to make. Yeah. One, like a competitive advantage yes. because like it's all going to hit in a way. They're like, great, you know, you're doing recycling, you uh, have a bike rack, but I'm like, EV charging, like it's the most differentiating thing. It is. Have. It's the most material too, because yeah. when you start getting more Teslas, people see that and then they yeah. know that like, this okay, is this is yeah. part of the community that's more focused on sustainability. With electric, we don't focus on the sustainability aspect. Uh, because in, I'm a true believer that anything renewable or progressive or whatever you want to call it, it has to, the economics have to make sense, right. right? That's why we don't charge like $500 from here to Austin. No, it just doesn't make sense. Right. It doesn't matter like how great we oh, are. Just because, yeah. So right. I, just because it's a green transportation, I'm not going to pay that high of a exactly. if there's a, a alternative. Right. It, it just has to make sense. With EV charging and, and, and building out the infrastructure now, you're just doing things that, that make sense on multiple fronts. And a lot of people say like, okay, well, I, I'm not really convinced on global warming, okay. which, which is fine, okay? You know what? Is it, it fine? It, <laughs> all right, right. Here's the reality, right? So I have met NASA engineers okay. that do not believe that we can stop the effects of climate change because of the current momentum that we have now. So we have to, instead of wasting money on climate change, we have to adapt to it instead. Uh, and so, okay, so if you believe that, that's fine. It's your, it's your belief, whatever. Right. But here's the irrefutable truth. When you drive an internal combustion engine vehicle, you're releasing noxious oxides into the air. You're releasing a bunch of different tailpipe emissions that are exclusive from CO2 that go into the atmosphere. And then when it rains, they come back down and they're in the air your kids breathe every single day. And those are irrefutable truths that are happening right now, right next to you. And because there's no alternative at a cost-effective point right now, not everybody can buy a Tesla, not everybody can right. buy a Bolt, and not everybody can charge them, I don't hold it against anybody that cannot buy an EV. But if it's within your means and you can do it, then I feel like you have a moral obligation to at least look into it and see whether or not it, it works in your lifestyle. It's out there on the web. So U UT, I think, did a story. Yeah. So yeah, that article. Yeah, it was like turned down six figures. Ugh. Yeah, they added. <laughs> did, did it make you feel uncomfortable? Because I feel like your you, friends see that circulating. Has that? I didn't. I didn't even consider the salary when I gave up. But it was difficult to see all my friends move into their new apartments and right. you know buy their new watches or whatever it is. Like right. it was difficult, right? I gave up a lot of freedom. You're just over here buying a bunch of Teslas. No, <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. Well, the biggest advantage of that was individuals started reaching out to me that were interested in investing. Oh wow. Um, and that was really that was an honor okay. because these are individuals that are so successful in life. And to be able to talk to them even for 30 minutes to an hour, or go to their offices and have a one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. that's like, that's a big deal. The whole reason I became an entrepreneur is so that I could talk to interesting people and meet people and like talk about ideas and get stuff done quickly. Is this all like bootstrapped, would you call all it? All bootstrapped. I'm not a huge fan of just raising venture capital because it's cool, right? right. A lot of people think like, oh, everybody else does it. Yeah, you yeah. should do it too. You lose a little bit of control of your company. I've seen like notice a tremendous shift in like the mindset of college students today. I feel yeah. like the the mind's like, I don't want to go work for somebody. So my advice though, to be honest, is go work for two years. Sure. I, I did three internships before I graduated. Um, so I had, a, I had a good amount of experience, yeah. but my honest advice is to go work for two years. Okay. You build up some personal contacts, you, you get some money, right. you save it. Well, you have a, you have a nest egg that's right. much larger than mine was when I started my company. So my family has had a history of failed entrepreneurial ventures. So my dad invested in a motel. And in order to keep it running profitably, the entire family had to move there. So okay. I spent almost two years, my entire family lived in one motel room. Oh, wow. It was me, my mom, my sister, one motel room. And we would go to school, we'd come back home, couldn't play outside, right? There's no front yard, there's no backyard. I tried to suppress the entrepreneur in me, yeah. 
but I just couldn't do it. I bought this car, it has $7,500 tax credit, and I told myself if the company doesn't take off, I can use that tax credit, offset the loss and depreciation, blah, 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 figure it all out, yeah. and then go work full time. But as I started to work in the company, I saw a significant potential for this, and I saw why it's important to launch this company. It was drastically increasing EV adoption. People love the cars. We have so many referrals to Tesla. We were literally creating a better service than anything that was out there today. And right. it was important for me to be able to do that. And then the third one was honestly, what I really was yearning to do was launch my own thing. And that's what I realized. Like, why am I, why am I not doing this full time? Is it because it's not a good idea or is it because I'm scared? And as soon as I knew that the answer was because I'm scared, yeah. I had to like slap myself and yeah. just be like, no, that's like that's not a good enough reason not to do this. Your business is growing, people love it, and there's a market opportunity here, you have to try. How do you first get the word out? Marketing, right? Like how do you yeah. get, how do you get the word out? Yeah, so, okay, so not only am I an engineer, my entire founding team are engineers. Okay. So we're literally all engineers. We have no marketing people. Oh, wow. Then. Yeah. Okay. We just kept trying out different things until something stuck. Okay. And you know, we're a startup. We only thing we have, as you, and you alluded to this before, is hustle. Right. That's all we have. So what do we do? We uh, will like tweet people who are tweeting at American Airlines because their flight was delayed. Uh. And we'll tell them like, well, why are you dealing with that? Do this instead. Uh, sorry that the shit happened, you know, do this instead, right? So we went from like 100 probably degrees, I need the wipers on this thing. Yeah. Started this summer Houston storms. Here's the difference. If you call an Uber to Austin from Houston. How, okay, so that was a question I had, because I was like, this, this should have been a more obvious question. It's like, how do you price out? And you've probably obviously done this and we're doing this now. I'm going to look it up for you right now. I guarantee you two things. One, it's going to be more expensive than our service, even with the X. So more than 165. Yes, it's going to okay. be more than 165, even with an Uber X. Okay. So that's like any random car. Right. And two, you can call 10 of them. Nine out of 10 will cancel because they don't oh, know yeah. where oh, yeah. you're going They're until not... they pick you up. Yeah. No, so they don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. So I'm going to type in Austin, Texas. We'll just go to the capital. All right, so it's it's right there, 157 for an Uber X. Uh, so again, you have no idea what the quality is going to be. Right. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. If you called an equivalent car, it would cost you $600 for an SUV at, at at our level. Yep. Yeah, they're going to cancel on you nine out of ten times. For 157 versus 165 in this car versus let's say a Kia Soul. You or can get anything. Yeah. yeah, you can get something where the guy has like uh, cigarettes. Yeah, see, that's my thing is like, yeah, asthma. So all those yep. things you mentioned about. Surfaces are sticky. You're like, oh, what is that? Yeah. Like, uh, Where do you consider the headquarters of electric? So we are based out of both Houston and Austin. It's okay. really hard for me to choose right now yeah. uh, because we're still figuring out like, where's the talent that we can recruit? Where do people prefer to live? Things yeah. like that. And when, as we scale up, it might change. Um, right now, it's really just, uh, it's four people. Right. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, and we go back and forth a lot. What are your plans for expansion of Electrip into any new markets? Is that on the horizon? Yeah. So there are uh, seven other national markets that are very uh, optimal for a service like ours. Okay. We are going to focus in Texas for a while um, just because it's the fastest growing market and we still need to, we want to become the best at okay. what we do. And that's going to require some development in software. Uh, it's going to require some proprietary things that we're working on right now to be fully fleshed out. And then once that happens, then we, we're thinking about moving into some of those other markets. Outside of the state? Outside of the state. You know, I, I read a couple things about the perks. We've talked about Wi-Fi, you know, comfortable driver, comfortable car. It's like a mint on a pillow sort of thing, just nice to see. But uh, it was like comfy slippers or memory foam slippers. Yeah. Was one of the... No, so what we do is we, we, this is a great marketplace, right? People have a great experience with us that we can always like put your product in our car and chances are like, if they like it, they're gonna keep doing it. Right. Great example, Richard's Rainwater. It's naturally bottled, bottled rainwater out of Austin okay. or Dripping Springs. Um, and they, people love it. Like our clients love it. Yeah. Um, and you know, when you have a great service, it's a great way to introduce your product. The slippers didn't work out so well. We had a dentist approach us about like having dental kits uh, in the car where they could like use it to like freshen up. And we were like, uh, and no <laughs> like one used they, it. Yeah, where they spin out their toothpaste. People can eat and drink or, or are yes. you comfortable? No, no, yeah. Okay. I mean, we've had, 
like these seats are synthetic leather they're right. vegan leather i mean they didn't skin vegans for this <laughs> like it's like a synthetic leather like legit all like, you ve vegan eaters yeah watch out <laughs> watch out these aren't as eco-friendly as you think <laughs> evs what other partnerships food beverage okay. that's fun yeah and then here's the last one uh charging yeah yeah we're looking for partnerships with charging um so one of the data points that no one has taken us up on um, and i don't understand why is that we know exactly when a driver starts to feel range anxiety. Oh, really? How, yep. How do you... Because we, we interview our drivers after a ride. So after the ride, the driver has to let us know, like, hey, at what point, especially the new drivers, we ask them, like, hey, at what point were you getting a little nervous? Like, when were you feeling like, eh, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm going to make it kind of thing, right? And we also track, like, you know, on certain days, at certain temperatures, when, what's, what's the power usage, this and that. Right, and, and we also track when people need to use the restroom. Okay. So we know if you're taking a road trip from here to Austin, where would you want to stop to charge? That data is, I feel, very valuable, and no one's taking us up on it. So if someone wants to build the, uh, the gas stations of the future, talk to us. Okay, yeah. that, I might have to let uh, folks at work know about that one. Absolutely. That's awesome. Right now, uh, Tesla's building out their supercharger network. So it, it's kind of funny because the first alternative to the Tesla supercharger network is going to have such an incredible advantage. And then all subsequent networks that come out, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be as great. A good analogy is a subscription model, right? So Netflix, they're pulling the office, all the Disney properties, so Marvel and all the Disney right, movies are gonna come off, right? Yeah. And then I think other companies are pulling their services as well, right? right? Well, here's what's gonna happen. People are gonna become so fragmented, they're not gonna wanna subscribe to like five different things. Right. So people are just gonna revert back to pirating. Oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, that's the reality of it. Right. And if they don't wanna accept that, fine, just yeah, see cool. what happens, right? right. Um, in the EV space, you can't do that. So what's, what's gonna happen? People are gonna revert back to gas cars. So I really don't want wow. EV networks to fragment out because right now, like Blink charging, I, I am a huge EV proponent, but I will never use Blink because <laughs> I already use ChargePoint. I don't want to subscribe to something else. I don't want to have to deal with the issues of like when I get there, it takes me forever to like activate it and plug in and this right. and that. So you're a ChargePoint customer? I'm a ChargePoint customer. Oh, okay. So once we use ChargePoint, we're not going to use another service because the switching cost is so high. So where can folks find out about Electrip? Where can they like you, yeah. follow you, If you Google Electrip, E-L-E-C-T-R-I-P, Electrip, you'll find us. We do some pretty cool stuff. If you join our mailing list, every now and again, we'll send out a special where, you know, that weekend, the rides are super cheap. Okay. And, you know, you can go up to Austin for, for a good time. You're giving Things out like promo that. codes? Or exactly. Anything? Another thing we do is for companies, if you pre-purchase rides, we give you a hefty discount. If you refer people to us, you get a bonus as well. We're trying different things, right? Okay. Like I said, with marketing, we, we try things out. So we'll try the referral program. If it doesn't work out, we'll move on to something else. Right. Is there any last things you want to plug for Electrip plug. or anything else that you want to put out there? If you watch this, and you think I have my shit together, just know that it's because countless people that put their time and effort behind the company okay. and help it grow because they believe in us and they believe in our mission. And if you're one of those individuals and you think you can help out in a certain way uh, because you believe that people should own more EVs or you believe that travel should be better, reach out. I, we're always happy to chat. Are you hiring right now? We are, we're hiring, uh, so mostly we're hiring drivers but we're also looking for interns. And then later on in quarter two of 2020, we are going to look for individuals that have technology expertise. Well, any, you have any questions for me, Mindy? Yeah, man, I, I was gonna ask you why you started at ChargePoint. Okay. Because that is not really like a typical thing you do. Like, oh yeah, I wanna sell EV charging, right? Like Since the age of 15, I've been about sustainability, wanted, was hoping and praying for a career in sustainability. Long story short, I ended up at ChargePoint because I took a chance on a smaller company um, a couple of years ago. So 2013 to 15, I worked for a, a company that was doing EV charging. And this was, I had quit a job at Google. Whoa. And I said to leave a company like Google, whatever I do next has to be big. I found this company on LinkedIn. They said they were involved in EV infrastructure. So they had a role in multifamily and so I, I went to sell for ChargePoint and I've been there two and a half years and I love it. That's so, awesome. Yeah.